Hey, Grace City, so glad to be with you on this online experience. We've got a lot of things coming up for you. Uh, we're gonna have some opportunity to worship together. We'll be in a series and hearing from one of our pastors, and then you'll be able to grab maybe your favorite beverage or whatever will allow you to get into a worshipful posture. In the meantime, uh, why don't you go ahead and check us out at wearegrace.city so that you can learn more about our church and next steps that you can take here as well. And so go ahead and get ready. We're about to start worship. Good morning, church. Will you please stand? Let's worship together. Weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high with all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, let faith be a song that overcomes the agency. Let faith be the song that comes the storm inside of me. Let it rise, let faith arise, let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you.
love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the Now to do the same thing for me Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you now How I need you now Oh rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing
are the same God. You are the same God. You touch the leprosy. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. The same. The same. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit, Almighty River, come and fill me again. Come and fill me. And fill me
Jesus, this morning we praise you. We're here to worship you and to lift your name high. We're here to declare that you, there's no one like you. And there will never be anyone like you. You're the God that keeps his promises. The God who is faithful no matter what. The God who is with us in every circumstance. He's with us in the valley. He's with us in the storm. We're here to praise you, God. And that's all we want to do, God. We want to know you. We want to have a relationship with you, Father. We welcome you to move in this place. We welcome your Holy Spirit to move in our hearts, to change our lives. We love you, Father, and we love each other. Amen. It's so exciting. We've got so much going on today, and so we're really pumped about it. So if you have been here for the last couple of weeks, you've noticed that we have some pancakes grilling out there and all kinds of toppings. But there's a purpose behind the pancake, and that is Passion Camp. And so we're really excited. Again, this year, we are uh, we're taking donations to be able to send students to Passion Camp this summer. If you haven't heard of that, yes, you can talk about that. Uh, Passion Camp is a great opportunity for us to be able to connect our middle school and high school students uh, to the Word of God and to each other, and, and hopefully, like last year, come back changed and allow the kingdom uh, to permeate every single area of life. So we're doing that again this year. So those pancakes, they are, um, they are awesome. They are delicious, uh, and they can be as uh, whatever gift you want to give and donate up to $10 million, we will take. Uh, but we're really excited to be able to send. We've got about 40 students who are, we're sending, and I don't, I'm not sure what the total number we have right now, but we've got over how many people that we funded? We're halfway there, y'all. Yes, that's good news. That's good news. So keep it coming. Um, go on the lobby afterwards. You can have pancakes before service, after service, after the next service. Just pancake it up, y'all. Get those carbs in. We got to burn them off, right? So we're really excited about that. This week, if you would like to get connected and find a way to serve the Grace City, we have Lake Cares, our mobile food pantry partnership that'll be here this Wednesday. And so it's a perfect opportunity to come together, help families that might be in need, and be able to pray with them and build a relationship and just uh, love where we live right then. And so you can come stop in. Uh, we start at nine o'clock and serve till 11, but you can come before that and can, uh, connect with some of our leaders there and be able to help us with that as well. Um, some other awesome things that are coming up this, uh, this, this week. Uh, this Saturday, we are having a mother-daughter tea. A mother-daughter tea. So if you're a mom and you have a daughter and you would love to treat them to some tea, uh, you don't have to have pinkies up. Everybody is welcome and wanted here. And so we would just love to be able to celebrate the kiddos and the moms uh, this weekend. And Saturday from 10 a.m. to 12, uh, they'll be right here. So for more information, you can connect with Tracy Ahern. But hey, we've got a special moment. We want to celebrate today. Today is Senior Sunday. And so we're really excited to celebrate with them. We've got a little video for you right now.
everyone stand and welcome to the stage our seniors for 2022. Please come on up, seniors. <laughs> this is the biggest graduating class we've ever had. It's so exciting. You guys go ahead and come on up. <laughs> um, I'd like to call all of our student ministry leaders up as well. Please join us. Come on up. Pile it in, scrunch together. So um, what a huge, huge, successful year it's been. It is absolutely bittersweet for us as leaders. It's the hardest time of year for us because some of these students we've known six since sixth grade and some of them we've known for six months but we love them all and the biggest thing that we want you guys to know I'm gonna face you um, you are so important in the lives of us as leaders and just as much as we have poured into you and hopefully changed your lives I want you to know that you have done the same for us so it doesn't stop here. It doesn't matter if it's six months from now or 10 years from now. I want you to know that Grace City will always be here and always be your home. And we love you. All right, if you guys want to be seated, and all I'm going to ask for you to do is just put your hands forward as we pray for the students. If you guys want to come and uh, get in close here. Good morning. Pray with me for these seniors. Father, I just thank you for this time that we can come together today. I'm so thankful for the opportunity that we have to worship together in a free country. And I'm thankful for these seniors. They're such a special, precious group to me. And I'm so thankful that I've been part of their lives and that they were placed in mine. And as precious as they are to me, I know they're even more so to you. I pray that you will draw them closer to you as they take this next step in their lives, that you will remind them to come to you for the answers that they need, for the, for the paths that they should take, because you care for them so much, and you'll be waiting for them every time they need you. Go with them through the busyness of this week. Enjoy the, the last moments of their, their high school career and just guide them as we continue. For it's your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Give them one more clappity clap. Awesome. Seniors, you can go be seated. We're so grateful for you. They have gifts. Tracy has money and candy for each and every one of you. <laughs> awesome. All right, friends, would you, would you stand with a meet and greet with each other? You can give your neighbor a hug and a high five, a yo and a bow. Hey, church family. How's everybody? Doing good. Hola, mi familia. Um, it is so great to be with you this morning. Uh, these last um, couple weeks, we've been going through a series we call the Watch Me. And that's the, uh, the big picture of the series. Jesus says this. What does he say? He says, follow me. 
He comes up to his disciples and he says, follow me, or follow me, watch what I do, and then go do it. That's like the example that Jesus gives uh, to us. And so we've been going through this these last couple weeks. Um, Recently in my home, uh, we had quite a big, significant change in my home and in my family. Uh, My oldest son got his driver's license. And I swear, he aged like five years in one day, and I aged like 50, um, right? Like, you know the feeling? I so, said, wow. I mean, he, he got his driver's license. So he's been having a blast enjoying this uh, newfound freedom. And uh, we, were, we were driving a couple of weeks ago. Um, we were uh, heading down, and we had this moment where we are like, oh, we need to go down to Orlando, and we need, wait, we need two different vehicles. Um, and Caden's just, I mean, you can see, I'll drive. And Steph's like, well, I kind of like the idea. You and I can drive together, and, you know, we can hold hands and listen to music and and drive, and he can drive the other one. And so this is a great idea, and we jumped in. And um, I I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but I drove the entire way looking in my rearview mirror. Um, 100%. This is the furthest he had driven and driven by himself. And so uh, I'm looking up in the rearview mirror and and holding hands. She's like, are you watching him? I'm like, I'm only watching him. Um, And we gave him one little bit of instruction as we jumped on. on I'm like, okay, we're going on the highway. I was like, just follow me. All you got to do, just watch me, follow me, stay behind me, okay? He's like, got it, got it, Dad, no problem. I'm like, cool. So you get in the car, I'm driving, I'm driving, I'm driving. I don't really drive like that, by the way, or else I'd be in every lane. Um, But I'm cruising, I'm watching, I'm like, okay, he's okay, he's good, good, good distance there. And then I'm like, okay, why is he in that lane if I'm in this lane? And then why is he, okay, why is he in that lane? I'm like, honey, he just got off the highway. I'm not kidding. Like, like we're driving, and he just, and I'm like, where did he go? So it, you know, Steph calls him a couple of times, and because we taught him, like, you don't talk on the phone while you're driving. Um, do as we say, not as we do. But, like, just wait. So he pulls off to the side. He's like, Hi. We're like, where'd you go? He's like, I just thought we were getting off in this spot. I'm like, I don't even know where you're at now. And uh, so we talked this out. He's like, I'm really sorry, Dad. He's like, this is going to be a sermon illustration, isn't it? I said, yeah, <laughs> yes, this is your penance. <laughs> this is going to be, he's like, and, and we'll call it even. He's like, all right, but I might need some money for gas. Like, you know, like this is the negotiation that happened. But I thought, like, how often is that the case with us when we're following Jesus, Right? We're going along, we think we're following Jesus, and then we're like, oh yeah, I know where we're going, Jesus, and we just go ahead and get, and she's like, that ain't the direction we were going. We're, hey buddy. <laughs> My wonderful firstborn. He also, part of, the, <laughs> part of the agreement is he wanted to make sure I confer to you and um, explain to you very carefully that he is a very good and safe driver as well, and he is, we're very proud of him. He's also good looking, because uh, he looks like his mom and not his dad, um, but but how often do we do that, right? I mean, we're supposed to be following Jesus, and then we're like, Whoop. and Jesus, you were just supposed to keep following me, and somehow, like, yeah, I know where we're going. I know where we're going. I got this down, and we just go ahead and go off. I don't know. I see it with the disciples all the time. Um, like, in Luke 9, 54, to me, is one of the funniest passages of Scripture. There's some people, and they're rejecting Jesus. And, and James and John, um, these two guys are like, hey, Jesus, you want us to call, like, down fire on him and destroy him? And he's like, No. Like, you've been fo- like, how did you think that's where we are? It's like, yeah, 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 we'll blow him up, Jesus. I'm like, first, I don't need your help. Two, no. How did you, how did you do that? And then you get to um, Jesus in the garden, and, um, and, and the time's coming, and he's, he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be crucified. And Peter's like, oh, I know where we're going, Jesus. A sword chops off a guy's ear. And she's like, what? And walks over, picks the guy, and like, all right, let's glue this back together. I mean, how often do we think we know, like, oh, yep, we know where we're going. Cool, we got it, Jesus. And he's like, just follow me. And we're like, yep. And then we get off on our own little thing. We go off on our own little side thing. Um, that's, That's what our heartbeat is as a church, is to learn to live and love like Jesus, to follow so closely, to learn how he loves. And so that's what we've been talking about these last couple weeks. Jesus says in John 13, love others how? Love others like I love them. Love each other the way I love you. I mean, that's the model he gives us. In 1 John 3, um, he tells us to lay down our lives just like he does. And so the question we've asked, there's just a simple question each week that we're looking at, is how did Jesus love this person? We're looking at story after story about the way Jesus loves somebody. 
And then just asking the simple question, how did Jesus love this person? And how does that teach, what does that teach me about the way he loves me? And how does that show me how to love other people? And that's the very simple question. With no agenda other than that, than to look at these stories of Jesus. How did he love them? What does that tell him about his love for me and how I should love others? That's it. And so week one, we talked about this woman who was caught in the very act of adul- adultery, excuse me. And, and, and the way we see Jesus loving her is that he doesn't condemn her. In fact, the only one who could judge her, the only one who could condemn her, chose not to. Whatever it means to love like Jesus isn't condemning people. Um, the week two, uh, we looked at this rich young ruler. This guy had everything, right? He's got resources. He's got his youth. Um, he's got power and authority. He's got all this stuff. And Jesus doesn't tell him what he wants to hear. Jesus tells him what would save him, what he really needs. And part of loving like Jesus is going to be that. It's going to be being honest, graciously honest. In week three, we looked at uh, last week with Mother's Day, Jesus and his mom. And how did Jesus love her? It's a beautifully intimate scene. Um, there in the scripture, Jesus, it's, it says he sees her, and I mean, he's in the process, he's dying for her, as well as for us, but then he also, he gives her new family. In this moment, these, these last recorded things that Jesus says on the cross, as he's dying for the sins of the world, he zeroes in and looks at his mom and says, mom, behold your son, son, uh, um, uh, to, to um, John, he says, John, behold your mom. Like, like he gives her this need, this craving that we all have for family. God's so good for us. Jesus is so good for us. He doesn't just die for our sins. He doesn't just see us. He doesn't just die for our sins. But even on top of that, even beautifully, he gives us this new family. And so today we're going to jump in uh, to a couple more stories. And it's actually some stories that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. Uh, before we do that, though, can we take a moment? Can we pray together? Um, I really like that we take this time uh, just to kind of focus our hearts in and focus our minds in uh, before we jump into the scripture. And so I want to give you a space just right where you're at. Um, even if you've never prayed before, just um, you might be, have questions about faith, but if you just want to, whatever prayer it is for you this morning, like, God, if you have something for me, I pray I would see it. And maybe for, for you this morning, if you've been following Jesus for a long time, um, maybe your prayer this morning is, God, will you make my heart sensitive? Would, would you make my heart soft to hear whatever it is you'd have to speak to me this morning? Jesus, I want to hear what your message is for me. And God, that's my heart this morning too. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just walk through this morning and not be changed. That we wouldn't just check it off the list that we went to church today, Lord, but that as believers in you, as people that have been changed by your cross, by your resurrection, by the spirit that you give us, God, that as we gather together, as we listen to your words, I pray that we'd be shaped by your scripture. God, we pray that we'd be shaped um, by these words that you have for us. We pray that we, God, I pray that, that this example that you give us, Jesus, on, that you would teach us again, what does it look like to love like you do? God, remind us of how much you love us and what it cost. In your name we pray, amen. So let's jump in. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15. Um, while you're turning there, uh, by the way, if you need a Bible, help yourself. We've got some in the lobby uh, on the bookshelf there. Just grab one after church if you want to grab a copy for yourself. Um, that's, most of the text is there in your worship guide. It'll be up on the screen as well because we want you to see these aren't just our words. These are, this is God's word and we want to be shaped by them. Um, but Luke 15, before we do Luke 15 or look into Luke 15, I want to just back up slightly and kind of point out something in Luke 14. In Luke 14, um, Jesus has this interaction, um, and he's, he's talking with these people, and he said, Jesus says to his host, now this is pretty audacious, he's been invited to a dinner party, and Jesus says to the host, hey, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't just invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, you, they may invite you back, and you'll be repaid. You'll get what you're looking for. But when you give a banquet, Jesus gives this crazy revolutionary thought. It's like, hey, when you're throwing a dinner party, When you're giving a banquet, you know who you should invite? Invite the poor, invite the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. They can't repay you, but you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And so Jesus says, hey, right now, have your heart sensitive to these people around you. Yes, you can go, everybody that's like you, you can go and and throw them a dinner party, but if you really want, like, man, go and do that to the people that you usually would avoid, and then when, when you see Jesus face to face, when you see me face to face in heaven, when you, when you enter into forever, you'll be repaid at the resurrection. 
And so he says this, like, like gives this open thing about loving others and what that looks like, and not just saying it, but actually doing it. And then I love this, verse 15, when one of those at the table heard him say this, he says, yep, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. It's like, right answer, ding, ding. Like, yes, Jesus, there's a great big party, a dinner party in heaven, and blessed are those that are going to be there. And then Jesus does this crazy thing, and if you want to look at this later, he launches into a story that talks about a party where everybody's invited and the people that are invited don't show up. But instead, the people that are off the street, the guy invited says, go get anybody you can and bring them on in. And Jesus gets to the punchline of the story. He tells about this great dinner party in heaven. He gets to the punchline and he he basically says this, yeah, everyone's invited, but some of you aren't going to be there. And the reason you're not going to be there isn't because you're not invited. Now, who is he saying this to? Is he saying this to the, the, to the sinners in the area? He's like, no, he's saying it to these nice, well-to-do people. This is pretty offensive. And then we get to Luke 15. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Luke 15, verse 1. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. I want to highlight a couple words here, just again, as we're jumping in. Um, First, the Pharisees. Who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees were were the religious people of the day. I mean, these were the ones that, um, they they hung out at the Christian bookstore. Well, the God bookstore. Jesus is right there. But but I mean, these were the ones that they had their, their bumper stickers on. They knew the Bible verses. They had memorized the scripture. They had, these Pharisees would have had like Genesis, um, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, like memorized. They knew the Bible verses. Um, they're, they're, the word Pharisee means to be separate from. Their whole identity was, we're not those people. We're, we're, we're honoring God with our lives and we're the, we're the ones that are living by God's word and we are separate from them. Their, their title, their name for their club, these religious leaders, Pharisee, means separatist purist, or a Pharisee. That's what the word means. And then it says these guys are, they're doing what? They're muttering. And what what is muttering? Greek, I love this word. Um, The Greek word for that, that we get our translated muttered there, it's uh, dio gungutsmo. Gungutsmo, it it means what it sounds like. Gungutsmo. That's what, and it means that. It's like... And in this word, in, in, in the text right here, it has dia in front of it. It's the prefix. It's like making it more so, thoroughly. And it means this. If you have a Bible dictionary and you want to say, what does this word mean? It means thoroughly grumble with smoldering discontent. You have these religious people that see Jesus and they are thoroughly grumbling with smoldering discontent at Jesus. Why? Because their whole identity is we're separate. We're Pharisees. And why are you with those people, these sinners and these tax collectors? And, then they, and what's their complaint? Is that Jesus welcomes them. The Greek word is prostekamai. Here's what it means. Ready? This is like, again, pull out a Bible dictionary. And you can use your little hyperlinks. There's biblehub.com. There's a bunch of other ones. Or if you have a Greek dictionary, an old one, if you are bored on a weekend and you like to read Greek dictionaries, I don't know. Um, what does it mean? What is that word? It's translated there, welcome, but here's what it means. Ready and willing to welcome warmly, to personally receive, accept. That's what the word means. You have these people. Their identity is to be separate. They are at Jesus. Why? Because he is warmly receiving and accepting who? Sinners and tax collectors. If you work for the IRS, we still love you. And Jesus accepts them. Jesus accepts everyone. Even them, even you. I mean, as I was trying to think about this, even as I was driving in this morning, um, even as I was driving in this morning, I was trying to think of like the picture. I, I don't know if you remember what it's like back um, elementary school or middle school, and specifically like that first day of school when you go in, or if you ever went to a new school, and it's that first day, and you walk in and you go through the lunch line, and it's pure panic. Because you got your little tray with your little milk carton and you got whatever they plopped on your... And then you got to do what? Where am I going to sit? There's something like, for us, this, this, you can kind of grasp it, but, but in this day, it was even, it was even more intense. Um, to, to have dinner with somebody, to meal with somebody, to share a meal with somebody, it was uh, um, identification. Like you're, you're associating, identifying with this group. Um, it was uh, uh, um, conveyed protection. 
Uh, that is like, no, you're in, you're in my group now. It's, it, again, middle school. Uh, uh, and also affection. It was a kind gesture. It was like all those things wrapped into one. There's still elements of that today, right? To share a meal, and Jesus is sharing a meal. I mean, think about this. Like, go back, and if this was 2022, and Jesus walks in, and it's middle school, and there's this group over here, and they're all huddled around, and it's the Bible club, and they don't cuss, and they've grown up, and they know all the verses, and they're all sitting there. But this group, there's, there's these other people over here, and the people over here, um, there's the girl that everybody knows has been sleeping around, or um, this young guy that just said he's gay, and we're like, oh, 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 or this notorious sinner here. I heard this. I heard he went to juvie, <laughs> whatever it is. And they're all like sitting here huddled around like, man, we're not them. We're this. We're kumbaya, my Lord. We're get... And they're there together at the dinner table. And Jesus comes through after grabbing his milk carton. And where does he sit? Do you understand why this is offensive to them? Where would you and I expect Jesus to sit? Well, yeah, we're going to go over the ones that have have lived right, have honored their parents, have honored God, have followed scripture, um, know the verses, and yes, we're going to go sit there. And Jesus comes in and goes, and goes and sits with the sinners and the tax collectors and eats with them. You can understand why they're... Why does he do that? Jesus hears this. And verse 3, it says, Jesus told them this parable, this story. Actually, Jesus doesn't just share one story. He shares a bunch of stories in a row. And they're familiar stories. I hadn't looked at them in a couple of years, to be honest. Like, I had gone through them, but I hadn't really gone through them. And I wanted to go through them again this morning. Um, he tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. He tells a story after story after story. You got the sheep and the shepherd... Um, you have the, the coin. This coin would have been a very valuable coin. It was possibly even used for like a wedding. Um, like a, we have an engagement ring. It was a, a something that um, a husband would give to their bride with, with these special coins on it, these 10 coins. And then he tells one about sons. Um, I don't have three sons. I have two sons. Um, also, my sons, sons out, guns out. That's right, boys. But he tells this story after story after story. Jesus starts launching into the story. Remember what the context is. Why are you sitting over there with those people? Verse 4. Here's his first story, the lost sheep. What does Jesus say? Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. Now, it's funny because we all need to repent, right? None of us have gotten it perfect. We've all missed the mark. But think about, again, think about who Jesus is talking to and what he just said. Jesus says, There is more joy over this one than over all y'all that think you got it together. You don't need to repent? Well, this one person who's actually softened their heart and turned, there's more joy in heaven over that one. That is offensive, isn't it? It, Maybe it doesn't offend you, but it does me. Because most of my life has been at this lunch table. That was me. That has been me. And if I'm not careful, that's still me sometimes. And that is offensive. That's offensive. (laughs) Jesus goes and he's like, man, there is more joy in heaven over one. Now, what is the point of the, excuse me, um, baby, can I borrow your water? Um, What is the point? That's going to look great on the video. (laughs) Thank you, I can't breathe. What is the point of the story? What is the point of the story? Um, you might think you know what the point of the story is, and most of the time, you might even hear it communicated in a certain way. But there's something really neat about this story. See, um, Bible uh, stories and the way Scripture is, is put together and the way they used to tell stories during this time period followed a very specific way. They used a lot of parallelism and a lot of um, inversion, a lot of... Here's what I mean. I happen to use the one marker that I didn't have open. Um, 
Here's what I mean. All right. Jesus tells a story about a sheep. I find the pictures are helpful. Verse 4 and verse 7. <laughs> Thomas really enjoyed my picture. Verse 4 and verse 7. Did you catch there was some repetition here? Verse 4 and verse 7. Um, there, yeah, here you go. Suppose one of you has 100 sheep, loses one of them, doesn't he leave 99? And then in 7, I tell you, um, one sinner repents then over 99. They would use a lot of repeti- repetition. Excuse me. So you have you, you have one, and then you have... 99. And then at the, um, at the end of the thing, Jesus says, you, one, and then 99. So there's this like, huh, it seems like those are bookended. And then the rest of the story is actually, it focuses in um, verse 4 and 5, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, excuse me. Um, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and goes and finds the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder. And then verse 6 and 7, it kind of takes that and flips it. Rejoice with me. Same word, joy. I have found my lost sheep. So what you have is, there's this idea of lost, and then found. And then at the end here, you've got lost and found. And in the middle, what do you have? What do you have in the middle? Joy, rejoice with me. He's full of joy and he's doing what? He's inviting others to come. So Jesus tells a story. The shepherd, you're like, oh, this, this, this story Jesus is telling, it's all about the sheep. The story is not actually about the sheep. At the center of the story is an invitation to rejoice with me, to celebrate with me. And then he ends with kind of a concluding statement where he says the same thing. And then Jesus launches into another story. Verse eight, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. So we got another story here. Um, that's a coin. Not really. I'm not sure which president that looks like. <laughs> but we'll give him hair. And a nose and a smiley face. There you go. That is the weirdest look. It looks like a chicken. <laughs> Should have practiced my artwork. Um, suppose the woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. Did you catch some similarities there? Literally the same thing. Says this lady loses a coin, then she finds it, and then this sentence right here does it again. Rejoice with me, because I found my lost coin. And then another summary statement. Verse 10, in the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of God over just one sinner that repents. And these people over here, that I took my lunch train, I came over and I've sat down, says Jesus, they mean a lot to me. But what's at the center of the story? The exact same phrase, rejoice with me. Rejoice with me. You're over here, and your joy is robbed because you're... And Jesus is like, hey, I'm over here at this lunch table. You're right. Why don't you come join me over here? Rejoice with me. At the center of the story is an invitation to experience the joy of the presence of Jesus. Verse 11, then Jesus continues. He says, there's a man who had two sons. So here we go, another story. There's a man who had two sons. And then he goes on and he describes over the next couple of verses just how lost this son is. It's one thing. It's one thing to talk about a sheep who doesn't know better and he's wandered off. You gotta throw him on your shoulders and carry him back. It's another thing to, to have a coin fall in the cracks and go after it. But when Jesus tells this story, this guy's really lost He's so lost. He's got a a fractured relationship. He leaves home. But when he leaves home, he says, hey, dad, I want all my inheritance right now. Like, well, that would be kind of offensive anyway, right, for us. But in that culture, it was the equivalent of saying, dad, I don't care if you're alive or dead. Just give me whatever you got. Extremely offensive. Nobody would do such a thing. 
You'd be banished from the entire community. And the father says, okay, go. He takes, he takes that, he goes and he squanders it. He spends it later, his brother's like, you spend it all on prostitutes. He's there and he's literally, Jesus tells the picture that he's down now feeding pigs and, and in the muck with them and wishing he, had, he could just eat some of that. That's how far he has fallen. That's how lost he is in this faraway place. And then, verse 20, it says, so he got up and he went to his father. He comes to his son. He's like, man, maybe, maybe I, I don't deserve to be a son, but maybe I can just get some food scraps. I mean, I don't deserve to be in his home anymore. I've screwed it all up, but maybe I can get some scraps of food. So I'll just go and say, hey, dad, can I, can I be one of your slaves? Can I be one of your servants? In verse 20, it says, so he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, I love those words. Remember, who's telling the story? Jesus. While he was, well, this, this guy is a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. So he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now, I often hear this passage um, of Scripture, and I've even used it as like, yep, I'm just going to sit on the back porch. And if they ever decide to come home, well, we'll talk about it then. But I love, I mean, did you catch it? This is one of those things, when I look at Scripture, and, I, and, and if we let go of the agenda, just like, what is this, what's Jesus really saying here? This, this guy has a long way off, but as soon as Jesus sees him, he runs. The Father runs after him. Um, you say, what, where's the word love? That word compassion, it means to feel that love so deep within you, it causes you to move. Jesus, of course, God himself, of course, feels that much love for us that it caused him to, to come down and to live among us, to eat lunch with us, but then to die on the cross for us. It's compassion. Over and over you see Jesus in the Gospels, moved with compassion, moved with compassion. It's the kind of love that's not just with words, but that moves you to act, to do something. And it says he's filled with compassion for him. He runs to his son, throws his arms around him, and kisses him. Has the son said anything right yet? No. He tries to start talking, verse 21. I love this. This is such a great story. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worried to be called your son. And, and the father says, you're right. No, the father says this. He completely ignores him. Verse 22. I love this. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put a ring on him. Um, and sandals on his feet. Verse 23 and 24. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. And there's a cow over on the side of the, uh, the, that he hears about killing the fatted calf. And he's like, man, I know I've let myself go, but there's going to be a weigh-in soon. And I'm on the menu. And he goes and he gets a cardboard sign and he says, eat more chicken on it. And, he, and thus begins Chick-fil-A in this moment. It's not true. It's not true. But... What's the story? The son of mine, this, he's, this, this kid's lost, and yet the father finds him, and in the middle of it, what is it? There's a great big party, a giant fiesta, a giant let's go celebrate. Let's go have some steak. Let's throw a roast. I mean, come on, let's do it. The whole town's invited. And then he goes, why? Because my son was lost, but is now found. Jesus is a fascinatingly awesome storyteller. He inverts this last bit, which is awesome. And then he's not done. You think he's done. Okay, he told three stories. Three is the magic number. Three points. Three point outline. ABC, we're good. Um, there's nice parallel. We're going home. Nope, Jesus isn't done. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. You're like, I thought Jesus, the story was done. He's like, nope, we got a new story we're telling. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And because he was Baptist, he turned around and laughed. No, I'm just kidding. I grew up Baptist. I pick on him a lot. I'm Baptist in recovery. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. What do you have here? Well, 
Um, the word the word translated there for near is the exact same word for join. It's like he's on his way to go join or come near or to enter into. So it's got this near join. And there's a party going on. There's joy and there's celebrating. Again. But it says, verse 26 and 27, he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. He identifies him, knows this, this is your brother. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fat cow because he has come back safe and sound. We got barbecue sauce and steak sauce and we're ready to have it out. And the older brother ref- became angry and refused to go in. He misses out on the party. So his father went out and pleaded with him. There's an invitation again. His father goes out, come, celebrate with me, rejoice with me, celebrate with me, have joy with me, enjoy the party with me. His father went out and pleaded with him, verse 30. Um, too, but he, we had to celebrate and be glad because his brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We had to celebrate. We had to. It wasn't even an option because there was joy. But here's the funny thing about this. How does this story end? It doesn't. He's coming near to join, does he? It's left wide open. There's no summary statement at the end of it. This, this son was lost and is found, but this son's the one that's missing out on the party. Rejoice with me, rejoice with me, rejoice with me, rejoice with me, the father says. Does he? Here's my question for you. Where do you see yourself in the story? Who do you see yourself as in this story? This is, depending on who you're at in the story, I guess it can be both really encouraging or also very challenging, maybe even frustrating. See, if you're here this morning and you're like, man, my left has been one string of messes after another. Uh, you know who I am? I'm the guy rolling around in the pig slop. This is really good news, isn't it? Because what you need to know, and if you're saying, man, how could God ever love me? I was talking with, I, with a friend a couple uh, weeks ago. And she was sharing about how, her conversion story. And she said there was, that was the point where I didn't know if, I, I, I figured it was too late for me, but maybe, just maybe my kids could hear about Jesus. She's like, I didn't realize how much God loved me. She does now. And if you're like, man, I, my life is a mess. I'm not, I don't, I'm not worthy of it. Here's the good news for you. is that the Father runs to you, chases after you, compassion for you, moves, open arms. On the other hand, if you see yourself as somebody else in the story, if you're like, man, that's, that looks actually probably a little bit more like me, this story can be really offensive and uh, challenging and even offensive, can't it? Um, Ray Steadman, he's a pastor, he um, passed away a couple decades ago, said, self-righteousness, this is the world's most deadly sin Our Lord spoke of this more frequently than any other sin. He dealt with it more severely and more sharply than any other sin. He dealt with it more severely. He could be tender, gracious, and accepting towards those who were involved in adultery or drunkenness or demon possession. But when he faced self-righteous Pharisees in their smug complacency, his words burn and sear and scorch. This sin is deadly because it's so easily disguised as something justifiable. This is what is wrong with a self-righteous spirit. It can always be proved by the book to be right. 
There's always an aspect of it that looks right. The character, that's characteristic um, is here in this story, is it not? There is a sense in which the son can be justified for his attitude. And he sees the picture, it looks to him perfectly justifiable that he should feel as he does. But that is always the mark of self-righteousness. It is an apparent right to look down on others and even be nasty to them. You say Jesus was harsh to the Pharisees? Very much so. Matthew 23, 13. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, hypocrites. And here's, this is scathing. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Rather than a party that everyone's welcome and everyone's wanted and everyone's invited, he says, no, you shut the door in their faces and you don't enter. You don't let others that are trying enter. Verse 15, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, but when you've succeeded, you actually make them twice the child of hell that they were in the first place. Verse 23, woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give your tithes. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill. Make some good Mexican food in there too, probably. You tithe, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, things like justice and mercy and faithfulness. Justice and mercy we often think of as polar opposites. Jesus is like, no, no, we should be, should be both of those. You've practiced, the, should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And he says other ones in there too. Uh, Philip Yancey is one of my favorite authors referenced him several times. He said, in social contacts, Jesus went out of his way to embrace the unloved and the unworthy, the folks who matter little to the rest of society, but matter infinitely to God. People with leprosy quarantined outside the city wall, Jesus touched, even as his disciples shrink back in disgust. A half-breed woman who had gone through five husbands already and was no doubt the center of town gossip, Jesus tapped her as his first missionary. Another woman, too full of shame over her embarrassing condition to approach Jesus face to face, grabbed his robe, hoping he wouldn't notice, but he did notice And she learned, like so many other nobodies, that you can't easily escape Jesus' gaze. We matter too much. The people Jesus denounced most harshly, he goes on, uh, the Pharisees were some of the most moral people on earth. He didn't give us the challenge of imposing our morality on others, but rather of spreading a far more radical message that God loves sinners. So here's my question. We're going to wrap up. Just a moment. The team's going to come on up. How did Jesus love them? How did Jesus love the Pharisees? We talk quite frequently and quite clearly about how Jesus loves lost people. Right? Um, And he does. But as I was looking at these stories that Jesus tells right here, how does Jesus actually love the Pharisees? The Diogongutsmo. How does Jesus love them? Well, it's simple. He invites them to the party too. He invites them to the party too. See, the same father that when he saw the son ran out and kissed him and hugged him and threw the robe on him and wanted to throw the party, that same father ran after and chased after the older son too and begged him to join the party. This one seems so far off, but he actually experienced the joy. That one was lost, but he was found. But this one that seems so close, he was so near. Does he ever actually get to enjoy and celebrate and rejoice with them? That's why I've, I've shared in the last couple months that... Um, here you might get me in. Um, 
that quote that if there's no joy in us, then something is wrong with our doctrine. Something is drastically wrong. We're going to close this morning with the time of communion. And here's the crazy, beautiful, audacious truth of the gospel is that you are welcome to Jesus' dinner party. <laughs> Jesus, um, I love that he paints heaven as this great big dinner party, celebration, wedding feast. But as a glimpse of that before he died, he, on the night before he was betrayed, he was having dinner with his disciples and he took some bread and he took some wine and he told them, guys, this is how much I love you. And he broke that bread and he says, this, my body is going to be broken for you. And when you eat this bread and you share this meal together, remember that my body was broken for you. He took this cup and he blessed it and he said, well, we're going to share this cup together and when you share this cup and when you do this, remember that my blood was given for you. This is how much I love you. This gift that we have of communion, it's, it's, it's something, it's a reminder of God's grace for us, but it's also a reminder that we all come to the table on equal footing, that the Father chased after each one of us and invited us to his party. Um, I want to give you a moment if you want to close your eyes for a second. We're going to pray. And then we're going to come. We're going to sing and share communion. Um, our communion servers can go ahead and we'll um, come on up and, and get in place. Jesus, I thank you for your great love for us. God, I know this story and I've known this story for years, but I pray that the truth of it would sink into my own heart this morning. I pray that for our church family. God, I don't want to miss out on the joy. I want to go with you. God, wouldn't it be so beautiful to have a church full of people that are running, trying to keep up with the Father, chasing after people? God, thanks for your love for us. Thank you for showing us what love is and how to love. God, thank you for loving me in spite of my, my own sin and my own self-righteousness. God, I repent of that this morning and may my righteousness be found only in you. In your name we pray. Amen. As you come forward, um, as we sing this song, whenever you're ready, just come on forward. And um, We practice the intinction method. You just pull a piece of the bread and you can dip it. The um, dark's the wine, the lighter's the juice, whichever is more appropriate for you. And just be reminded again that this is his body and this is his blood for you. That's how much he loves you. And as you come forward today, as you come forward today, you're going to be up here with people that are very different than you. And that's a beautiful thing because it's his blood that unites us. Um, let's worship together.
was your fault Still you love me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth You paid it all for me You have been so, so This morning, you were handed a Connect card. Um, in a moment, our ushers are going to come and they're going to receive our offering this morning for those of us that call Grace City home. Um, you can uh, um, just throw those Connect cards in as they come by. If we can encourage you, pray for you, um, if we can help you plug in in any way, please let us know. We'd love to serve you in any way we can. Um, but let's continue to worship, and this, this gift, this offering will be out of that worship as well. He loves us, oh, how He loves us, oh, how He loves us, oh, how He loves us. He loves us, 
for being with us this morning. Um, I pray you're both, you leave both encouraged and challenged uh, this morning. Um, one quick thing, uh, I promise this was not intentional with the sermon, but in the video with all the students, I actually missed one student. And Charisma, Brooks, where are you at? Charisma, um, it's right over there. And we cheer for every single one. Um, so glad you're with us this morning. Um, as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he shine on you and be gracious um, to you. May you see him turn towards you and give you his peace. Love you guys. Go in peace. What a powerful message. We hope that it impacted you in a life-changing way. In the meantime, you can go online at wearegrace.city and learn more about the church, next steps from baptism to Bibles. And we would love for you to join us here in person anytime on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. In the meantime, we hope that you continue to be the church right where you are with what you have right now. We'll see you next time.